Welcome to the Fairwinds Energy Education Podcast for Thursday, September 26th. Hi, Ernie Gunderson here. We've had a surprise walk-in visitor here to Fairwinds in Burlington. Um, his name is Matt Noyes, and he's an assistant professor at the School of Business Administration at Meiji University. We're glad to have him here today. He's a very knowledgeable American with a Japanese perspective on what's happening in Japan today. It's nice to see him. Very happy to be here. Fairwinds has been a crucial source of information for me over the last few years and really invaluable. And so it's a really tremendous pleasure to be here. When I woke up on March 11th, um, the accident was already underway. You know, it, it happened at 2 in the afternoon in Japan, which was in the middle of the night in, in America. So I woke up and at 8 we knew there was a big earthquake. And by 9, there was a comment that the State Department was involved in getting batteries. And when I heard that, I knew the very first day that there was going to be a meltdown. And, and the reason is that these huge pumps that cool a plant mm -hmm. can't run on batteries. And that told me uh -huh. that the cooling pumps were wiped out. And the secondary source of cooling the plant, all these remote ba battery-operated valves and things like that, were running out of power. I told Maggie, I said, I, I'm going to devote today to staying on top of this. We had a New York Times call and Washington Post call and Wall Street Journal call and all that stuff. By Monday, CNN had called and, and mm -hmm. I was asked to be a, an expert on uh, John King USA. I had seen my government cover up Three Mile Island. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, back in the day when that happened, I was a nuclear executive and I was on television telling people there's nothing to fear. Well, as I, as I learned in the 1990s, you know, 15 years after the accident, there was something to fear in that the, the, the government had lied to me and then I had lied to other people about the impact of TMI. So I said to Maggie, mm -hmm. I'm not going to let that happen again. And by Monday, you could see the nuclear industry and the Japanese government mm -hmm. all lining up. I said, I am not going to lie to the people of Japan like mm -hmm. my government lied to the people in America. So that's how hmm. Farrowin started. I said to Maggie, I don't care what this means personally, but we can't let this get covered up like Three Mile Island was covered mm -hmm. up. And this is much worse than Three, oh, yeah. Three Mile Island. And unfortunately, it's becoming a much worse cover-up as well. Well, I was on the street getting ready to leave on a... I was going to take a flight to Portland that day, so I was going to take the train from Shinagawa Station to... Narita Airport, standing in the middle of the street and the earthquake happened and it was bigger and longer and uh, just, you know, shaking these concrete telephone poles and sh walls, everything was just moving around us. It was bigger than anything I'd experienced and I had lived there, I guess, about eight years at that time. We went actually went home first to see if anything was damaged and some things had fallen down but nothing too bad. So then I went to try to go to the uh, train station and everything was, lights were off people were pouring out, no trains, no power. And then I tried a bus, and they told me Narita Airport was closed, no, again, no airplanes, no power, everything was just shut down. Went back home, and then started to get the news about what was going on. So first was just the actual tsunami news, the earthquake, and then the tsunami news, which was so astonishing to see, you know, just whole villages completely wiped out. Um, so that was bad, but then Fukushima, I don't remember exactly how I realized how, how quickly it was that the Fukushima issue came out, but it was pretty quick. So I went upstairs in my house and got online. And so I started Googling it, getting, starting to get news. And I would, you know, really, you're soaking up news like crazy at that point, especially as soon as we realized that there was the meltdown possibility at that time, we were told. Actually, not not even fact it was told at the beginning, it wasn't even likely, not not possibility, but very unlikely scenario. But I would go, and then I'd be looking on the news, and then periodically I'd go downstairs where my wife was watching TV, and something would come up on TV, and it would be obvious to me, like, this was just not true. I'd just been reading news about something different. And she's Japanese, so she's watching the Japanese news channels. And then later, it would, what would happen is I would come downstairs and something would come on the news in Japan as breaking news that happened, that was news internationally a day before, two days before. Um, a good friend of mine, this is, was called the News Gap, is how people describe this, journalist friends of mine did. 
And so a good friend of mine who's an excellent interpreter was asked by an Australian uh, news team to come with them. They wanted to drive up to Fukushima and they needed an interpreter. And so he's, right, he's in the car with them and he's listening to the radio. And so he would tell them news just coming off the radio. And the Australians were like, oh, yeah, of course, we know that already. Is there anything new? So he was shocked. The news gap was so distinct. So this continued for months. There was just this that complete gap between the global coverage of Fukushima and the local. And some, I, I found that the, uh, not only was the global coverage sort of more frank or more honest, yet often uh, it was just more accurate and more informed. They somehow, I don't know exactly how, but through ways that uh, people have of, well, basically a lot of it was analyzing the design of the plants, which is why your broadcasts were so great. So here we're getting information about what is the design of these reactors and what does it mean that you lose cooling in this area or that there is a steam explosion in this area. How do you read that? And then particularly the question about detonation or a deflagration, a, oh, dis geez. a distinction that I learned from you. Um, <laughs> all of that information was coming from outside Japan and not from inside Japan at all. While you were doing those broadcasts, the Japanese government was telling people that the condition things were, they didn't say stable, but they said, of course, there was nothing to be afraid of, there's nothing to be worried about, there was a very unlikely that there would be a meltdown. That turned out to be the news well after they knew the meltdowns had happened. Mm. But the news kept, they stuck with their story that meltdowns were not going to happen. That was really one of those things that's sort of shocking and offensive. Japan had a long-standing anti-nuclear movement. So there are a lot of people who immediately recognized what was going on and they could, they could, and their reaction, of course, was to be completely offended by this and outraged by what was going on. Um, on the other hand, so there's, that's one kind of layer of people. Another layer of people were young people, a lot of young parents in particular, who were afraid. And a lot of them are people who did have access to some sort of international news, and they were picking up that there is a huge distinction between what they're being told by the government. And the news media in Japan was essentially what was being said by the government was what was reported. They would do a news conference from TEPCO officials or government officials in front of this press corps, no follow-up questions. So a TEPCO person could say, you know, the measurement is X, and nobody would ask, well, how do you know the measurement is X? Is that measurement everywhere, or is it just in the one place that you measured? Or what does that measurement mean? How is it? They don't follow up anything. They just take it at face value and move on to the next question. This was going on, but some people were disturbed by the kind of news gap and the problems there. They became a big part of the new anti-nuclear movement, which kind of was very different than the old movement, a very different composition. And then the really difficult and frustrating part is a lot of people tried not to think about it and that's still going on now it's mm -hmm. amazing how much people don't want to think about it don't want to hear about it don't want to talk about it yeah that's the advantage when you put something in the air that's going to kill you 20 years from now you've got 19 years that you don't have to worry the cancer statistics will start to grow in the next couple of years for lung cancers and then solid tumor cancers and other years after that, eventually it will get driven home that a lot of people got a very high exposure. So I got a question. Mm. What I noticed when I was over there for the, my two tours, a lot of women involved in trying to protect their families, but also trying to push the government to be more responsive. Is that an irrational impression on my part, or did women step up and, and uh, take a different role in this? Women have always played a big role in the anti-nuclear movement, so that wasn't entirely new. The main spokespeople or the main organizers in the, an, in the anti-nuke movement for years, most of the people I th would think of are women. It is, what it is a reflection of is that some, t some organizations in society, for example the labor unions, are decidedly male in terms of both the membership but especially at the leadership level. This is true also of some nonprofit organizations, but mostly in the big, like the labor movement, the politicians, overwhelmingly male in Japan. I mean, a 
by UN statistics. They're like one of the, they get a very low rating in women's participation in government. Industry and government, certainly any kind of corporate and business is completely, and a lot of the unions are still very male. But the anti-nuke movement had women. But I think also the new kind of movement that grew coming out of this disaster, it's sort of non-traditional for Japan. The way of functioning was much more spontaneous. There, were, there was a big impact of people who were consciously in favor of not having a very institutional movement. The past anti-nuke movement very much defined by its institutions. There's this group, there's this group. And this was more, let's have something very open so that people who have never participated in any social activism at all will feel comfortable. So there's a great video from the early days of one of the very first demonstrations that actually I went to with my son. They interviewed all the people, I mean all, they interviewed many of the people as they're walking along and they, the interviewers kept asking them, is this your first demonstration? And all of them was, oh yeah, this is my first demonstration. None of them had been involved in any kind of activism before. So that was a really distinguishing feature of the anti-nuke movement after Fukushima. So I, I have one question I gotta ask is how did you find Fairwinds? I probably found Fairwinds at the beginning just by googling Fukushima reactor meltdown etc. At the beginning some like uh, Reuters had its right now I think they have a firewall up, a paywall rather up but behind uh, for their news but at the time they put it down so their coverage of the of Fukushima was all available. Reuters was I was a good source that I used a lot. The New York Times was slow but good. They would come they would take a little while to report, but when they reported it was generally it seemed to me very good and they did a lot of analysis. They gave you much richer stories than you know, what you'd get on Reuters or whatever. But there was a huge amount of not the big mainstream, but the sort of smaller sources of information. Fairwinds being one of them. Fairwinds, the reason that Fairwinds was so important was because in this disaster, one of the whole issues is credibility of your information. You're watching, for example, Michio Kaku was interviewed a couple times, had some great lines about, they say it's stable, it's stable, like someone hanging off a cliff by their fingernails is stable. That's not, there's no information there. It's a great kind of sound bite. But in terms of trying to understand what's actually going on in these reactors when you're being told things that are simply not true, you really need someone who can tell you, here's what the cladding is on a fuel rod. Here's what it looks like when it gets hot. Here's how it breaks. Here's what that means. And that kind of information and experience was really essential because when you're listening to the news and you're trying to figure out what to do, you can't make your judgments based on sources that don't feel credible. You desperately need someone who you could feel like, okay, I do trust this source because the person's not trying to sell me a line or a kind of interpretation, they're just explaining to me how this thing works. So Fairwinds was great. I would sort of hang on to your video cast. I was always waiting, when's the next one, when's the next one? One other source I should mention that I use today, I mean I check it on my phone all the time, is uh, enenews.com, I guess it is. From the beginning did an incredible job of gathering all these news sources, including Fairwinds. Yeah. E and E is one I I watch a couple times a day. So yeah, they're they're very good. And the other one is informable. Let's fast forward now. You got a plant that's nowhere near stable and likely to remain a problem. God knows how big a problem, but a problem for years to come. The Abe regime is, has just won the Olympics. Can you talk a little bit about the politics behind the Olympics in Tokyo and what your opinion of that is? Well, the push for the Olympics has been going on for a long time. It was the pet before project. Before Fukushima, yeah. Oh, yeah, before Fukushima. It was the pet project of Ishihara Shintaro, Shintaro, who was the former governor of Tokyo, who was a leading extreme right-winger in Japanese politics. I mean, he was really the voice for belligerence with China, for getting territorial disputes. In fact, he's the one who provoked the whole battle that's going on with China now about those islands in the sea because he was going to buy them. He was going to have Tokyo, the Tokyo government buy the islands from their owner, some guy who had a title. So he provoked this huge political crisis because he, was wa he wanted to see Japan be more nationalistic, more aggressive. The Olympics are a pet project of his from the beginning 
to put him put Tokyo on the world stage. There are huge development projects involved in holding the Olympics. New stadiums get built, which means quantities of money going to the contractors, who, which are the historical base of support for their party, for the right-wing parties. There's, a, there's just a lot in there, patronage, etc., that, that can happen. And it's just political capital, and it's for the nationalists, it seems like a very positive thing. So then there's the accident, so they continue pushing. The, and the problem is that right after the accident, there was a big push to... There were kind of two things happening. One thing was a push to help the people of Tohoku, of northern Japan, after the tsunami. So this was a great thing and totally reasonable. It's a huge disaster. Tons of people have lost their lives and homes and li livelihoods have been wiped out. On the other hand, what happened was a separation where people would talk about the tidal wave and not about the nuclear disaster. So they talk about this is terrible, we have to help people, but they wouldn't, uh, this, that conversation didn't include helping the people who were forced out because of Fukushima, or helping all of us who are potentially exposed to contamination. So there was a separation of those issues. The Olympics became part of this, let's go Japan, we can do it, strong Japan, we can recover. This is a sign for people of the kind of recovery of Japan. It's a morale boost. It's, it's all of that. And yet it's based on, again, this denial of the reality. The timing was unbelievable to me. That it would happen now. They would get the vote now, right on the heels of the exposure almost every day of new hot spots, new leaks, new, you know, higher readings than ever recorded before. All of that is happening right in the lead up to the Olympics. I was surprised. The Abe regime just got voted yeah. in with, yeah. with majorities in both houses yeah. and an economic turnaround under Abe. So he's feeling pretty good. Now he's also been awarded the Olympics. Does the average Japanese realize that what he's been telling them about the radiation fallout in Tokyo and in Japan in general is wrong? Or do they again just not want to want to worry about the details. I don't know if I'm in a position to say what the average Japanese person thinks, but uh, sort of two things. I think on the one hand, there are people who just don't want to know and don't want to hear about it. And so if they hear anything that sounds good, that's enough. I'll hold on to that part. So there are a lot of people who are for whom the Olympics is, they'll be like, oh good, he said it's okay. In seven years, it'll be fine. I don't need to hear any more. That takes care of my concern. On the other hand, it came out in the paper right after he spoke that there was a question in the paper, did he lie or was it just a mistake? Because he claimed that the radiation, the contamination in the sea was limited to, I think, 3 kilometer, 3.5 kilometers around the plant in the ocean. Nobody believes this. And nobody has said this, actually. No credible people have even claimed that this was true. So this was just something that he kind of, I don't know where he got it, that he threw in as a, a to the Olympic Committee, saying it's not that bad. The water, it's a little contamination in the ocean right near the plant. It's all, it's contained. That's been their line, is it's contained. They've said that it's in cold shutdown. I don't think they've even said that it has uh, changed from that status. No, which is a, Which is astonishing, right? Uh, we put a video together um, back at the end of 2011 about that issue of cold shutdown. And uh, the example was you know, George Bush on the carrier deck saying uh, mission, right. accomplished. mission accomplished. Yeah. That's exactly the mission had not accomplished at Fukushima, and it won't be for 10 or 20 years. And I just pray yeah. that there's no, no big earthquake now. So that, you know, the tank farm is all held together with plastic pipe. Yeah. So the, the tanks are weak enough, but the plastic pipe is going to snap if there's a big earthquake. And then, of course, the wall that they built along the water is now pooling water behind it so the seismic characteristics of the buildings are different so if there's a big earthquake we don't know how those buildings are going to react mm. and if they tilt or worse yet topple what little cooling is getting in is going to be jeopardized and i've said we could be back to 311 march 11 2011 again the site is far from stable i don't care what god you pray to but pray that there's no earthquake that's critical. My impression has been that the biggest concern, the tanks are a huge concern, but the biggest one is the spent fuel pools, which are exposed, have huge quantities of material in them. They're going to try to take the assemblies out next month or the month after. How hot is the spent fuel pool? If mm -hmm. it loses cooling, 
what does that look like? Is that is it is it fuel that's depleted enough that it's not going to do very much, or is it the kind of thing where you can that's have a, some massive explosion and that's a really good question, and I definitely need to answer that, and I'll do it right now. The fuel pool at Unit Four is the most critical fuel pool because they have an entire nuclear core out of the reactor and in that pool that's still relatively hot. It's been out now for three years. And you have to cool a nuclear core in water for five years before it's cool enough to be air-cooled. A lot of what we call decay heat is gone. The issues of the pool evaporating over a day are no longer with us. Back when the accident happened, it could evaporate off all of the water in the pool in a day or two or three uh, because there's enough decay heat. Now we're three years out. So the evaporation from the pool probably would take a month. There's still enough heat to do it. But in a month, human beings can do a lot, assuming the fuel pool retains its integrity. So my big issue is if there's a, a big earthquake and the pool cracks, we still are in jeopardy of that fuel getting hot enough to burn in air. It will take longer to burn in air, which gives people the, the opportunity to correct it. But still, they're not out of the woods yet. The other problem, though, is moving the fuel. The fuel is like cigarettes in a cigarette pack. If you pull the cigarette straight out of the pack, it doesn't break. But if you pull the cigarette out at an angle, or if the pack is distorted by you're squeezing it or something, you're going to snap the cigarette. Just like that in a nuclear fuel rod. These racks have moved. They've been distorted because of the earthquake. And there's junk that fell on top mm -hmm. of them and distorted the tops. So. As they pull the fuel, if they pull too hard, some of these bundles are going to snap. And when they snap, the fission gases that are still inside of Unit 4 are going to be released into that envelope. You know, they put a big cover over Unit 4. The reason they put that cover on is so that if the fuel snaps, they can treat those gases through filters before they put them up those high stacks. But there's one mm -hmm. gas that can't be treated, and that's Krypton-85. It's noble gas. It goes right through. They built that envelope so that if the fuel snaps, they can catch the gases before it gets released to the environment. But at the end of the day, the Krypton-85 is still going to go up to the stack. It's happened in the U.S. where we've snapped a bundle, and you have to evacuate the fuel pool area and let the gases go up. There's really nothing you can do at that point. So about a day later, you can come back in and begin to recover. There's one of two things are going to happen. Either they're going to pull too hard and snap the bundle, or they're going to be unable to pull all the fuel out of the pool. The other part of the problem is that the Unit 4 fuel pool has 200 bundles of brand new fuel. And brand new fuel, while cold as a cucumber, runs a risk of starting a nuclear chain reaction. The nuclear fuel in the new portion of the pool is more likely to undergo what we call a, an inadvertent criticality, a nuclear chain reaction that nobody wants. And I built fuel racks, so I know that the gap between the fuel is really, really critical. If the fuel gets too close together, you will get a chain reaction. And that's not something you want to happen in a fuel pool. Well, as they're pulling this fuel out, they mm. have to be very, very cautious that they don't get the fuel too close together. That's a weakness of this Mark I design. The fuel pool is up in the air and it's uh, unprotected. They had a crane snap just last I week. Saw it in the yeah, news and last that, week. That, that dropped. That didn't sound good. No, it's another indication of problems that will continue. Well, I think we're going to wrap this up. And I, uh, thank you very much for coming today. It was, it's really cool to get a walk-in guest from Japan. <laughs> Doesn't and, happen. Uh, right and and Fairwinds appreciates all you're doing over there. Well, thanks. We'll continue to help spread the word about Fairwinds as a resource to people.